30 years ago today, the nation and the world were sent into shock when President Ronald Reagan and three other people were shot outside a Washington hotel. At 2.27 p.m., a lone gunman, John Hinckley Jr., opened fire on the president as he left a speech at the Washington Hilton. Secret Service agents flung President Reagan into a waiting limousine and rushed him toward the White House, unaware that a bullet had struck the president in the lung. What happened in the chaotic minutes and hours after the shooting is the subject of the new book, Rawhide Down, the near assassination of Ronald Reagan. And we are joined by the author, Del Quentin Wilbur. Thanks for being with us, Del. Thanks for having me. First of all, what made you want to write a book about the assassination attempt of Ronald Reagan? Well, you know, it was really interesting because I'm not a presidential historian nor a Reagan scholar, and I got interested in this because I was um, I covered the federal courthouse for the Washington Post. I'm a Washington Post reporter, and I covered a uh, hearing involving Hinckley where he was trying to get more freedom from St. Elizabeth's, where he's been held since 1982 when he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. As we know now, he was obsessed with Jodie Foster, the actress, and shot Reagan in the hopes of impressing her. Well, a few days after this, I got called the um, FBI field office in Washington by an agent who was trying to convince me not to write a story about an undercover investigation that had nothing to do with this Hinckley matter at all. And I'm sitting there talking about the case, and he gets up from his desk drawer. I mean, he gets up and goes to his desk, rummages through a desk drawer, comes back and slaps something in my hand. And I look down, it's a gun. Hmm. I went, I went, uh... Yeah, I wasn't expecting this. And he goes, that's Hinckley's gun. I said, what's it doing in your desk drawer? And it got me thinking about this case and how it's been treated by history. And I went to the library and looked it up. No one has written a book about this day. And I said, you know, this is a great opportunity to explore something. And so I called up Jerry Parr, the agent that you mentioned, flinging Reagan into the car who saves Reagan's life twice on this day. Mm -hmm. And you really come to realize that Ronald Reagan's life hung in the balance of a split second a split-second decision and an inch, because that's how close the bullet was to his heart. Yeah, and I want to ask you about Jerry Parr, because he was in charge of the president's security that day, but he was also responsible for allowing so many people to get close to the president. At the same time, though, he is credited, isn't he, for helping save Reagan's life? Yes, you know, he saved Reagan's life twice. You know, he gets him out of the way of the gunfire from Hinckley very quickly. If he's a split-second slower, Reagan, you know, the bullet that struck Reagan ricocheted off the side of the limousine, slipped through a small gap between the door and the door frame and struck Reagan in the left side, right about here. And he, you know, lands in this heap. And Jerry Parr, by acting so quickly to get him out of the way of fire, you know, John Hinckley had an effective range of about 20 to 30 feet and at stationary targets. And by acting so quickly, he got him out of that way. If he's a split second slower, Reagan probably would have gotten hit in the head. And on the way back to the White House, they're in this limousine. I'm sure you've been stuck in, in D.C. in presidential motorcades, you know, and they go on and on and on. And imagine this scene. Jerry Parr looks out the window of this limousine, and he sees three people on the ground, a bullet mark in the window of the limousine, and he's checking out the president, and that limousine is alone. Mm. It's hurtling down Connecticut Avenue without any other security. Really? And that's when, after he checks Reagan out, and he finds out Reagan's okay, and so he goes on the radio, rawhide is okay, rawhide is okay. And well, that's Ronald Reagan's that. Explain to people what that means when he says rawhide is okay, because that is the title of your book, Rawhide yeah. Down. Rawhide is uh, Reagan's Secret Service code name, and that's why he used it on the radio. But 30 seconds later, he realizes that Reagan's in a lot of trouble. This bright, frothy blood's on his lips, and he's got to figure out what to do, so he makes the gutsy call to go to the hospital. The doctors I've talked to said if, if Parr had continued to the White House, Reagan would have died. So in a matter of about a minute, Jerry Parr has saved Reagan's life twice. Now, Jerry Parr has to live with the fact that, and he, he often talks about this internal struggle he has, and that he did save the president's life, but he also allowed Hinckley to get within 15 feet. Right. And that's and a tough thing. how is he dealing with that? How is he balancing that? You know, I think he recognizes the fact that what um, his training and stuff saved the president's life, um, and he recognizes what he did was a pretty amazing thing. But he also, I think, has some regret about the complacency that his agents um, got into in that period. For example, that was the 110th visit the president, uh, a president, had made to the Hilton in the decade before. And I think they just got lulled, and that's the where the rope line always was. Hinckley opened fire behind a rope line, an unsecured rope line, just 15 feet from the limousine. And that's where it always went. And they never examined that, because that's just the way it was. You know when you're doing stuff over and over again so rote mm. that you don't realize what you're doing could have 
fatal consequences. This book is just really fascinating. Not only do you detail how you know the president got to the hospital and all the chaos that ensued there, but you also had some palace intrigue at the White House over who was in charge. There was the infamous news conference given by Secretary of State Alexander Hagan, and I want our audience uh, just to take a quick look back at that. As of now, I am in control here in the White House, pending return of the vice president. Seems very vague. What was going on at the White House, and why wasn't there a clear plan? Well, they, are, they were trying to have a clear plan, but the problem was the vice president, who normally would run matters in Reagan's absence or any president's absence, was on an airplane flying back from Texas that did not have secure voice communication. And so they couldn't really reach and tell him what was happening. They sent these secure telexes, but there's a wonderful scene in the book where Al Haig is on a phone in Jim Baker, the chief of staff's office. Jim Baker's already left to go to the hospital, and there's Haig on the phone going, turn around, George, turn around, you know, trying to get, but Bush can't hear him. The static is so bad. And so I think that lack of communication caused some issues, and I think Haig also really wanted to do what was right for the country, and he thought what was right was being in control and being in charge. Other people in that room, in the Situation Room that day, and at the White House, didn't think so. As we look back at history, in your book, you say the assassination attempt, which happened less than 100 days into Reagan's first term, defined his eight years in office. How so? I think what this event did is recalibrate Reagan's presidency. What, I, what surprised me, and a lot of stuff I looked in this book surprised me, because what you think you know, you really don't. It's not just that vivid video clip that we've all seen a thousand times is that, you know, Ronald Reagan at the, at the hospital cracked off all these wonderful quips and jokes, and he was very brave. You know, honey, I forgot to tell, honey, I forgot to duck, he told his wife. Um, when he saw his three top advisors, he said, he said, who's minding the store? And later he's writing these wonderful notes to nurses, you know, and he's trying to entertain people. Mm -hmm. I think when the American people heard about that, they, um, it formed a bond with them, like they were caring about him as a person, and it also revealed something about his inner character, because if we remember, Ronald Reagan had one of the most scripted presidencies up to that point in history. And this was its most unscripted day. There was not a thing that went according to plan. And we got, by doing that, we kind of, the facade of the president vanished. And he became an ordinary guy like your uncle or your aunt that you were pulling for to live. Um, you know, and I think that was really important to helping him later. Well, the book is full of just fascinating detail. Lots of research went into it, and it's a great read. Del Quentin Wilbur, thanks so much for being with us. We do appreciate it. Thank you. I had a great time. The book is Rawhide Down, The Near Assassination of Ronald Reagan. It's available in stores now.